Welcome, Nancy. Great to have you here today. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. I hope that uh, I hope that everybody can see me and hear me because if you can't, tough. Also, <laughs> um, this uh, I, I'm I'm listed as Steve Steve Johnson here, and uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put out this challenge. If you if you love what I have to say, please remember that my name is Nancy Lyons. If you hate what I have to say, I'm happy to be Steve Johnson. Um, and it's a real uh, thrill to be here today, and uh, I appreciate y'all having me. Um, you know, I did write a book, and I wrote a book um, that uh, really uh, features a lot of themes that aren't new. And, um, you know, one of them is fear, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And fear is sort of an international um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an equalizer. We all experience it. We don't often talk about it and work isn't exactly a space where we feel safe talking about it, but I'm not going to talk so much about technology and digital product as much as I'm going to talk about fear and how it impacts the work that we do. And when we learn to kick our fear in the face, we can actually deliver better product. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I hope you can hear me and see me. I'll tell you something. I miss you. I've never met any of you and I miss you. I miss people. I miss being able to see faces and, uh, you know, engage with people and pivot based on how people are reacting. So I hope you enjoy the message I've got for you today. And like I said, if you don't, my name is Steve, Steve Johnson. Um, so, so most of what I write about oftentimes isn't new. In fact, I write a lot about simple stuff that we all know or have known, but we unlearned because there's so much competing bad behaviors in the world, in the world of work, in the world of teamwork. And a lot of what we need illuminated for us, a lot of what we need reminders around is a new stuff. It's the stuff we've forgotten or become complacent about. And let me just tell you that I think that even in the midst of a pandemic, when we are all distributed and working from our home offices, we forget that work is still a melting pot. It forces us into relationships and interactions with people who might be or likely are entirely unlike us. And right now there's a magnifying glass shining on those issues more than ever, right? Like we are in the middle of a political conversation that has divided the country and we're afraid to talk about the things that matter to us or to exist in our values and be loud about them because, well, you don't know who you're sitting next to. And we bring that baggage to, and I, when I say we bring it to work, I am 100% cognizant of the fact that many of us, most of us are working virtually right now. And if we're not, we probably should be. Um, but, you know, that melting pot forces us into these relationships with people that we don't actually know or have no control over whether or not we have to work with them. We don't pick our teams. And if we did, we would make the mistake of often picking people who reflect ourselves back at us because that's where we exist and where we're most comfortable. And it doesn't happen a lot. You know, that melting pot doesn't happen a lot in other parts of our lives. We have to deal with people who we might not like that much or don't agree with in the context of work. And in the rest of our lives, we tend to surround ourselves with people that don't cause discomfort or don't make us a challenge our thinking or try to uh, argue with us or with whom we have conflict. Um, and, you know, this idea of bringing your whole self to work, well, that's when we do our best work, when we bring our whole self to work, when we are all contributing to creating safe space. And yet it's almost impossible to do when we're afraid of how we show up in the context of this melting pot. So it brings up a lot of stuff in us, including all kinds of fear. So most of what I'm about to do is point out how fear sabotages performance. And having an awareness of how fear shows up is the best way to combat the unnecessary barriers that fear creates. And listen, fear is everywhere in the context of work. It drives how we behave and how we make big decisions. A company, let's talk through some examples. A company may back out of a potentially great deal because of fear or a team leader or a boss lays unfair blame on a direct report out of fear. An employee or a 
team member may not speak up in a meeting because of fear. Entire parts of our economy, like the stock market, can plummet based on people's fear. So if you think that this topic isn't a big one and an important one, and one to wrap some self-awareness around, you're wrong. We've gendered fear. Women are seen as more fearful than perhaps men, or toxic masculinity has allowed or forced men to keep their fear tamped down, to not bring it to conversation, to not be maybe aware of it. Fear is what we're going to talk about today because it is the real damaging four-letter word that we rarely dig into. So in, in this book, uh, Work Like a Boss, I talk about five types of fear that I see the most at work. And those things are also, I, I just want to, I just want to back up for one second. I'm not using slides today. I'm not using slides. All you can see is my face. This is not my ideal scenario, but you saw what happened to that audio and video situation earlier. I don't trust these platforms. And I think slides take away from the only sense of interaction I get with audiences. So I'm trying to connect with you and I hope you feel that. So slide slides, you got me and I hope you're happy. My name is Steve Johnson. All right. Fears that come up at work. I, I talk about these. I feel very strongly about these and perhaps you'll see yourself in one of these. We humans fear conflict, hmm. but what makes product better sometimes? Little tension little conflict. We're afraid we're not good enough. And that is a human fear that we all share. And I don't care if you can admit it or not. It's true. We all have that little demon that sits on our shoulder that tries to tell us that we are not good enough. We all have that self-talk, that audio on repeat in our brain. It doesn't matter how far you've come, how senior you are in your career, how long you've been doing it. And we heard just moments ago that my company has been around for nearly 20 years. I was seven when I started it, but still 20 years. And in those 20 years, I can tell you that I often fear, fe feel fearful. There's a mouthful. I often still Feel, feel fearful. We all do. And if we say we don't, we're probably not being honest with ourselves or others. We fear what others will think of us. That's a big one. And it's one we don't often talk about because it's a tough one to admit. And we fear we will do the wrong thing. We will make the wrong decision. Also, we fear the unknown or the unfamiliar. Here's the thing. Right now, most organizations are feeling tremendous pressure to innovate. And we often confuse the word innovation with the word invention. Now, let's clarify what those two things are. Invention means to create something new, something that was never there before. Innovation means to tweak something that exists, to change, to alter, to evolve. So if we fear oftentimes the unknown or the unfamiliar, we probably don't have the necessary mindset to embrace the possibility of innovation. And that's a problem. There are opportunities for us to innovate in everything we do all the time. I sometimes tell clients or customers, it might be innovative if you answer the phone. Just answer the phone. Because right now, human interaction is a rarity and people would welcome it. So innovation isn't a rocket ship to Mars. Innovation is simple shifts in what we're doing or thinking right now. Simple evolutions that can't happen if we don't embrace a change mindset. And what are humans? Well, most humans are resistant to change. Most humans like what they like because they like it right? Most humans want to be predictable. They want their lives. For, it's why this whole pandemic thing has sort of tossed us on our ears, really. We're like toddlers. We like routine. We like to know what we're doing from one moment to the next. I liked my commute. I knew when it would happen. I like how I get ready in the morning, right? And this thing, this pandemic thing, my son could walk in here at any moment, at any moment. The last time I did a talk, he came in shirtless and tried to offer me the remainder of his lunch in the middle of a talk. Anything can happen. 
And that requires a change mindset. So if you think that it's not something that you have to embrace in all facets of your life, you're probably wrong. So not everyone will have every one of these fears, right? The fear of conflict, the fear that we're not good enough, the fear of what others will think of us, the fear of doing something wrong, or the fear of the unknown or the unfamiliar. But I will bet you that everyone will have at least one of these that shows up in their work selves. So let's start with conflict. I've come to realize that most people feel that anything other than, hey, you did a really good job, or hey, that's great, or yes, I agree, is conflict. And let's be honest, if you're from Minnesota, right? If you're from Minnesota, you really don't like the conflict. In fact, Minnesota nice is really a nice way of saying passive aggressive. We aren't going to say what we don't like, but we'll make you feel like garbage in wrapping it in language that might be more palatable. So we've got that down to a science, right? Because we don't like conflict. But see, if you ask somebody, hey, what information are you basing that on? That could be construed as conflict, or I disagree. I've been thinking about this a different way also, conflict, and yet there's not really any conflict in either one of those statements. Most of the situations we perceive as conflict or confrontation actually aren't terribly aggressive. Like we very seldomly see physical altercations or passionate screaming matches over simple disagreements, but we do see opinions that push another person to explain themselves more clearly. We do see comments that require a colleague to reflect on their actions or their motivations, questions that force a teammate to consider an alternate perspective. These are some of the most valuable types of conflict that we have to learn to accept and engage in, learn to have the self-awareness to understand what it's important for us to move into, into that kind of conflict. These situations bring up fear in us because most people are bad at engaging with divergent ideas and perspectives. Let that sink in a second, because it's true. Most people are bad at engaging with divergent ideas and perspectives. We assume that questioning someone's assumptions or disagreeing with a colleague is a bad thing. We assume conflict is bad or unhealthy or damaging, but the truth of the matter is we're just bad at it. It isn't bad. We're just horrible at doing it. Conflict is necessary and it's good. I have seen people respond to conflict with defensiveness. No, I didn't actually see it that way. Deflection, that wasn't me. That was Bob. That was Bob. Victimhood, why are you always seeing me as the person who brings ideas this way? Denial, we all know what denial looks like and more. And here's the other thing. I think this is something that also can be gendered, right? I think that um, women often struggle with how best to show up in conflict. And I hate to point out gendered issues, but I think they're important because we've all been socialized to manage conflict in very specific ways. Men are good at it. Women don't like it, right? Women are more passive aggressive. Men like to argue. None of these are actually true. These are messages that we've been culturalized to believe. And at work, well, work cultures generally double down on how we handle conflict, right? Because there are other people measuring how well we handle it, or if we invite it, or if we participate in it. And oftentimes that's a check mark against us. And yet our products would be better with some healthy tension, some healthy conflict, some divergent opinions, challenging of assertions. Those things make our products better. So I've seen all of these things, defensiveness, deflection, victimhood, denial, but I've also seen interest and acceptance and curiosity and real connection. Because when people respond with those things, conflict, makes us better. 
conflict actually challenges us to see things differently, to recognize other people's opinions and value in contributing, right? The next thing I want to talk about is this idea of not being good enough. I mean, we're, you know, many of us, I would say the vast majority of us probably in this, in this session are Midwesterners. We don't get to be raised with the confidence of the coasts. People, we're flyover. We're nothing. We're not good enough. But the truth is many enoughs play gusts. Most boil down to one in particular, and that is good enough. I'm, you know, all of us, right? I'm not buff enough. I'm not, I'm not fast enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not you know, handsome enough, whatever it is, we are all plagued with our own set, our own unique set of enoughs. I don't do this well enough. I'm not good enough at my job. I'm not smart enough to get that promotion. We plague ourselves and that little demon that sits on our shoulder helps us, but it all boils down to being good enough. So there's the performance side of good, like smart enough and talented enough and knowledgeable enough accomplished enough. The list is vast, but there's also the value side of good, like not worthy enough or undeserving. And I can't save you from many of those value things. That's what a good therapist is for. But the truth of the matter is most of those things are untrue. They're things that were baked into our psyches, either in school, right? In school, like I often talk to people about how much I struggle with our emphasis on higher education. When school didn't teach us how to work and it didn't really teach us how to think, it taught us how to behave. It taught us how to shut up, how to get in line, how to wait your turn, how to avoid conflict. It taught us some skills that have manifested in the workforce in unhelpful ways. So, the fear, you know, the fear of not being good enough or the value side of good enough, not worthy enough or undeserving, this fear keeps us from speaking up when we have a good idea or offering to do something valuable because we're afraid we're not going to do it well. Or lastly, this fear cultivates submissiveness and deference within us. You know, one of the things that I like to remind people, especially now, I mean, I didn't know that I was writing a book that would be ideal for a post-pandemic world, but it kind of is. And the reason for that is we rely on hierarchies and organizational thinking to drive how we work. And now that we're all distributed, we can't wait for them to tell us to make a decision. We have to take initiative regardless of what our role in the context of making a product is. Oftentimes we have to take some risks. We have to take initiative. We have to put ourselves out there. All of the things that our fears tell us to avoid doing. I once uh, read a, a, a quote that I think speaks to that idea of submissive, submissive, sub submissiveness and deference quite well. Um, often, this is the quote, often in walking through our fear, we discover that the strength of our fright was out of sync with reality. Let that one sink in. Often when walking through our fear, we discover that the strength of our fright is out of sync with reality. We all have moments that we can point to where we recognize later that our fright prevented us from something awesome, but it actually wasn't based in reality. It was out of sync with reality. There was no reason to be that afraid. I used to think I was gonna be an actor, a stand-up comic, and I would ride around blocks instead of walking into auditions because I had horrible stage fright, if you can imagine that. Horrible stage fright. And it took me actually moving into another career and having to present in another context, having to stand on stages in another context to recognize I could have done those auditions, but my fear was out of sync with reality. 
While we spend a lot of time worrying about all the possibilities of what could happen or what other people might think or you know, all of the reasons why we're not good enough, we actually miss opportunities to act and to prove our fears wrong. We miss opportunities. We miss our next big thing. We miss, miss opportunities to prove ourselves because we fear we're not good enough. We fear what others will think of us. Maybe once or twice at work, you've worried about looking inexperienced or too young or too old. That's one that comes up a lot these days, right? We only really care about millennials or Gen Z. And I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, being generationalized. Or maybe you've worried about looking too dumb or too smart. And if you're a woman, some of you are going to think, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine thinking, being afraid of looking too smart. But if you're a woman and you're afraid of undermining a man in a meeting, it has happened. It has happened. If you're a person of color, you navigate these sorts of situations very carefully. And for us, it's important to recognize that, right? All of us have these cultural stories. All of us have the fabric of what got us here woven into our DNA, right? And so this stuff shows up in a variety of ways. But the truth is we can't be, in our culture, in our society, nobody's allowed to be too anything. What would people think if you were too? I've been too my whole life, too loud, too masculine, too fat, too direct, too, 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 too. We, have a, we live in a judgy culture. So of course these twos play into how we see ourselves and how we operate. See, policing of people and their behaviors, how they show up in meetings, that happens all the time. Very especially in work contexts. Policing of other people is actually how we feel better about ourselves. And policing happens to women all the time, all the time. Is she raising her voice? Is she, is she, you know, being assertive enough or too assertive? It happens from other women. It happens to men sometimes too, often happens to women, but we live in a culture that likes to police other people because if I can police you, then that puts me here and makes me feel a little bit better about myself because you're down here. So wanting to be liked or accepted actually compromises our success. Wanting to appeal to everyone is not going to make us friends or allies at work, and it's not going to create the next opportunity for us. We got to be brave. We got to show up. We fear that we'll do the wrong thing, right? In school, remember I talked about school and what it didn't teach us? In school, quizzes always had the correct answer. And assignments, they had instructions that you should follow because if you don't, right? If you don't, that's a check mark. As kids, we're punished for not following the very specific rules that are laid out for us. And I think this continues into some of our early jobs, even as teens. And then somewhere in adulthood, we all got jobs where we had to start taking initiative and deciding rather than being told what to do. And that is a tough change. You know, I have a 14-year-old son. And just recently, I was talking to him about mortgages. I know, I'm trying to put the stress on him. There's not enough stress in the world. I'm talking to him about mortgages. But he wanted to understand how they worked, right? And so I talked to him about how one gets a mortgage and how oftentimes the ownership of property helps you to build wealth. And my 14-year-old son said, why don't they teach us this in school? Why aren't they teaching us these practical skills? I would much rather learn that than algebra. That's a whole other thing, right? I can't touch the algebra thing. I mean, he might be a rocket scientist. I don't know. So algebra is helpful. But we aren't teaching our people how to show up strong in the world. So it's left on parents often. But the, the, the residue of those educational experiences are baked into all of us. And they show up in weird ways, regardless of how senior you are in your positions. So 
it's a hard change, right? It's a hard change. Some people don't fare well when they feel the pressure to take initiative or take risks. And this leads to that common fear, that fourth fear that I talked about, which is the fear of doing the wrong thing. When we don't have a roadmap or a set of instructions, some people cave under pressure. They cave under pressure of doing the right thing. We assume that aside from one single thing that only smart people must know or would do, everything else is wrong. So here's what I've noticed. And I think this is important in product work. If there is not an obvious right way, then there are many right ways. And we don't live in a culture that really operates there. The idea of many right ways is something that I think our industry, I think technology is really sort of forcing the awareness of the many possibilities in making a thing, in achieving an objective and delivering on a milestone. But culturally, we don't really get that there can be many right ways. If A and B both seem viable and possible, then maybe either of them is right. Oftentimes, and this is something that I try to impress on people all the time, oftentimes doing something, anything, is the right thing because there is no other way to make progress. And I think, you know, that comes up when we talk about innovation too, because innovation is a 99% failure. You know this. You know this better than anybody. We have to fail to succeed. We have to experiment. We have to try and screw it up to learn the lesson so that when we try again in the next sprint, we might get it right and deliver something better, right? Anything is better than nothing. Any movement, any risk or initiative is better than nothing. And ultimately, ending our fear of doing the wrong thing will make our products better because we are willing and able to take risks. There's fear of the unknown. So here's the thing, humans are wired for homeostasis. Our minds and bodies try to maintain the status quo at all costs. We like what we like, right? We talked about this already. We like our commutes. We like our routines in the morning. We like what we like. So that means that uncharted or unfamiliar familiar territories can put many of us into fear mode, right? We, we like the routine. I like the process. I like to follow the process. I like my checkboxes. Those checkboxes make me feel comfortable. I like what I like when I like it. We're all that way. We're all wired that way. Some of us more than others. And this fear is deeply intertwined with other common fears. And it causes all of the what ifs, all the what ifs that we ask ourselves. We aren't sure what lies on the other side of a decision or an action. And that, that is stressful and hard. So we don't do anything. We become complacent. The team works the way the team has always worked. We do things the way we've done them because I don't know what'll happen if we try this other thing. So this fear keeps us making predictable choices and predictable isn't always right or best, right? This fear puts comfort first at all costs. One could argue that part of what splits the nation and I'm not going into politics, but hear me out. One could argue that part of what has our entire country at opposing sides is this fear of sacrificing our comfort. It shows up in crazy ways in everything we do, at work and at home, in our relationships, our fear, right, of sacrificing our comfort. We put comfort first at all costs. We've heard the saying, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. And we seem to blanket apply that at work, but it's just not true. Sometimes the devil you know sucks 
and you just can't pe see past the suckiness. Sometimes the devil you know is the problem, but you've never experimented to get past it to see what else might be. So we respond to fear in crazy ways. You know, the ideas of fight, flight, or flee. We often think of that as what we might do if we were attacked by, say, a bear, or we were in an emergency situation. But those very same reactions also show up at work. They're just disguised as something else. Fight, flight, or freeze. So fight at work shows up like territorialism or defensiveness. Obviously, most people don't engage in fist fights at work. HR would have a real tough time with that. And we can't do it in virtual settings, right? Or with distributed workforce. We can't have fist fights. So that's not what I'm talking about. But the fight instinct here, it almost always looks like territorialism and defensiveness. Hoarding or drawing harsh boundaries around a project or team, getting territorial about who owns what information and refusal to collaborate. Those are all fight responses. Defensiveness can look like throwing people under the bus or not taking accountability for something that goes just a little off course or that side talk, you know, the side talk with lots of teams would not want to admit it's happening, but it happens. I knew that plan wouldn't work after you support the plan publicly, or I knew that guy was a ding dong. I knew this wasn't going to fly. All of those things are also fight reactions. Fighters sometimes gossip and create secret alliances rather than just dealing with the issues at hand. And part of that happens because we also don't like conflict, right? As humans, we are wired to avoid conflict. And so it shows up in these unhealthy or unproductive ways. So flight at work is overanalyzing and avoidance. This is a quieter response, but people don't actually leave the workplace or quit. That's not what I'm suggesting. But instead, fleeing often disguises itself as hard work but it's not productive work. If I'm heads down, if I'm doing, if I work a lot, you know, there's a lot of people that get stuck in burnout, but what they're really doing is just staying where they are, spinning their wheels. So if someone is afraid of looking dumb or sounding unprepared, they will withdraw to their desks or their home offices or their insulated pods and perseverate on details. If they're afraid of the unfamiliar, they hash out every possible scenario and try to plan for any outcome. And if they're afraid of doing the wrong thing, they will keep researching in solitude until they have enough information. Here's a spoiler alert. There's no such thing as enough. There's never enough information. Flighters might self-sabotage by simply avoiding the person or the situation that they fear. And we all know those people. You either know them in your work life or your personal life, or you have someone you report to who doesn't like to deal with an issue. And so they avoid, they shut you out. They ice you out. Avoiders, super unhealthy. And if you are one, Recognize that and think about what you might do to move around it, to operate in spite of it. So those flighters will try to switch teams or not raise their hands to participate. And freezing like fleeing at work is not literal. They're not going to stand there paralyzed, right? The freezers just don't do anything differently. They can't decide how or what to deal with, so they don't. It's like that urge to maintain the status quo at all costs. So here's a fascinating detail about fear. There was an article that I read in the New York Times and it was all about fear. And it said the most concrete thing that neuroscience tells us is that when the fear system of the brain is active, exploratory activity and risk-taking are turned off. So let me read that again. The most concrete thing 
that neuroscience tells us. So the most, the most concrete thing, the most provable thing that we've learned from neuroscience, the brain, tells us that when the fear system of the brain is active, exploratory activity and risk-taking are turned off. One could argue that the most important thing we do in the product world is explore, is experiment, is take risks. One could argue that. So when we're in a state of fear, other cognitive activities that could benefit us at work, like brainstorming or making a decision and just going with it and just trying, just dipping our toe in, those things are basically paralyzed. Fear disables the good, healthy behaviors that we need to get work done. So what do we do with all this pent up fear? Well, remember earlier when I talked about the kinds of people who didn't seem to fear? I used the word seem on purpose. They do fear. They just seem not to. They are really just moving ahead anyway. Let's assume that your fear isn't going anywhere. The only way to deal with your fear is to move through it, to walk with it. So these are my tips for fearing less, for recognizing your fear and fearing less. Believe that you have agency. See, I see a lack of agency in people of all ages and all job ranks all the time. I talk to people who seem to believe they don't have agency in their lives or on their paths, and yet they do. You do. You want to know why? Here's a little tip I got from a famous therapist. Her name is Pia Melody. She said that all humans are valuable simply because they were born. So we have this way of ranking people and the value of people in our society, in our culture. And none of it is true. If you're breathing, you have value. You have agency. The only thing standing between you and the power of that agency is you and your mindsets. So changing it will actually be helpful in the context of your work. So you don't have to earn the right to act with agency, but you do have to act with agency for people to see it in you. We are less functional when we depend on hierarchy for decisions and for power. We are much more functional when we all show up with agency and the ability to take risks, the desire to take risks. What's the relationship between agency and fear? Believing in and acting from a place of agency reduces fear. If you believe you are an active agent in your life, there is less to fear. No one can take that from you once you believe it. So many of the stories we tell ourselves that generate fear revolve around losing control. But if you start from, from a place of knowing that you drive your life, those fears will loosen their grip on you. And practicing self-talk or positive talk, I know this is crazy, but I talk to a lot of therapists and psychologists and pulling some of my information together. And the power of self-talk is real. Your biggest, en your biggest enemy is yourself. And the stories we tell ourselves have impact. We see bad talk, right? Our, we see and we choose to bad talk ourselves all the time. We beat ourselves up and say things like, why did you say that? And that was so dumb. And that wears us down. Doing the opposite can actually have the opposite effect. So you might think you don't have any control over your negative image of yourself. It's just what you were born with and you've always possessed. Shift your self-talk. Celebrate the wins. Be a little bigger in those celebrations because doing the opposite of that lousy self-talk can have the opposite effect. I'm not saying you have to tell yourself sunshine and butterfly stories all the time, but do think about the tone of what you're thinking to yourself. If you say, Ugh, I'm terrible at this job and everyone's going to laugh at me, you'll probably crash and burn eventually. Not because it's your destiny, but because you've gotten yourself all worked up. 
You believe a dumb story. Instead, offer yourself encouragement. Think through realistically what the worst case scenario is. You heard me say I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. For 20 years, I've ebbed and flowed through the garbage of owning a business, right? And some days I woke up and my self-talk consisted only of, I am not going to die today. And as long as I'm alive, I got some hustle in me. And it helped. It helped. So to people wondering how you got to the metaphorical table, the reality is it doesn't matter. You're there. What are you going to do with it? And flex your resiliency muscles. Why do we need resiliency at work? Because work is physically and mentally stressful. Our fears exacerbate this. People throughout history have experienced major traumas and come out on the other side with composure and compassion and strength. The resilience a woman draws on to recover from a debilitating injury after a horrible accident requires strategies we can also use at work every day. You have all been through trauma. You have all had rough days. That has created, hopefully, resilience and resiliency in you. Are you dead? No, you're here. Tap into what you know to be true about your strength and your resiliency, learning from those experiences. We might not think we're wired like that, but we are. Like no one is perfectly wired that way. It's a muscle that some individuals have strengthened over time and through practice. And you have the opportunity to strengthen with time and through practice. According to the American Psychological Association, resilience isn't something we have or don't have. Resilience involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. We can help our bodies and minds by growing and flexing our resiliency muscles. Most adults like that routine and familiarity, push against that. So conferences and industry events like this are opportunities. Oftentimes they cover best practices and perspectives that validate what you already think. But the real opportunity is in exploring difficult to topics at events like this. Instead of best practices, what new practices are you introducing? How can you challenge social and professional norms that are limiting? Can you talk about ways that fears and emotions and behaviors impact how we work together, not just how they impact the work we're putting out into the world? Explicitly talking about these things, like fear, illuminates the, un the usually unspoken ways traditional work works against us. So between our weaknesses and our insecurities, we convince ourselves that we can't or we shouldn't, that we'll fail or we're undeserving. And if you bring nothing away from this discussion, bring the fact that all of that is untrue. Fear is everywhere, but you are stronger than that. It is surmountable, and you can kick it in the face. I thank you for having me. I can answer questions if you'd like. And yeah, boom. Boom. Oh, there you go. Jump. Great one. Steve Jones. <laughs> well, and the good thing is actually the audience doesn't even know, so they're not getting in on the inside joke. We see... Oh. Excuse me. Which which we have to give a little context. So so in our screens behind the scenes, we see Steve Johnson under Nancy's uh, picture, uh, but the audience does not. So so, uh, but now with that, okay. So you have this book out, and this is uh, and I love the play with like lions work like a boss. Uh, certainly, just how it comes off, right? Um, uh, it what is uh, so talking about the thing that reason why someone should pick it up today? What is the the thing that you'd say, hey, you, you need to pick this up today because of this? Well, I think every uh, business book is written for executives and leaders and entrepreneurs. And this is a book that's written for us, just every human. Um, and that's a major audience. But the truth is, I think work has gotten a little dysfunctional, a lot dysfunctional. I think the reason that many of us want to work for ourselves or many of us you know, start our own companies or for a variety of things is because the worst of humans shows up in the context of work. And this book is really written to help people get their arms around, you know, those um, ways of being and those behaviors that contribute to success and contribute to healthier work cultures and team cultures. And I think when we can create healthy, productive work and team cultures, we build better product and we all benefit. And we're all responsible and accountable for it. And I think we've abdicated responsibility. It's the, 
It's the product manager's job to make this team healthy. It's the organization's job. It's the client's job. It's your job. It's all of our jobs to contribute to healthy uh, work product and healthy team dynamics and culture. That's fantastic. In fact, there's a funny video that I'm going to be playing at the beginning of tomorrow that sort of is that sort of a joke on sometimes product management and sometimes how we as product managers try to abdicate some of that responsibility and then the humor around that. But uh, certainly really appreciate your time today. Uh, we're a little tight for time for questions, but maybe if anyone does have a question for Nancy, uh, is it possible that they put it in the Q and A and that you might be able to respond to it afterwards? Sure. And so if there's a Q and A tab on the right-hand side, you should be able to see, you can submit a question in there. Nancy will respond to you. And then of course, follow Nancy at and Lions. Uh, and of course, get this book. Uh, and your previous book, is your previous book still available for oh, people yeah. to get? Yeah. Okay, it's good, slow good. Burn. Slow burn. It's also at Nylons because I've been on Twitter long enough to have a very unprofessional Twitter handle. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 so I used to be a dyslexic kid. Apparently it's still, uh, still coming out. So uh, yeah. Uh, well, appreciate your time today, Nancy. It's been fantastic. And we didn't, uh, well, I was hoping to meet your son, uh, but you know, maybe next time. The dog came in. That's, okay. Yeah, you know, there you go. Yeah. Well, and so for everyone else, uh, we're going to be going at 210 in two session, breakout sessions. Uh, thank you, Nancy. And you can go into your the rest of the event. You can check out places. You can network. You can just take a few minute break. But 210, the next things, remember there's small group discussions. Those are first come, first serve out of the workshops. And then there's also the uh, major uh, breakouts, which are under the, uh, the breakout uh, area, sessions area. So see you in a few.